Right. And so, you know, so you, you, you got married and you were married for, you know, you know, a period of time. And I think maybe in the eighth year, what, what led to your disenchantment with your husband and your marriage? What, what happened around that eighth year that things began to fall apart? Well, I think, I think it's a very, unfortunately, I think it's a very typical thing that happened to us. We were both working full time. We had two small children. They were involved in a lot of activities. We were involved in a lot of activities. We were going a million miles a minute mm -hmm. trying to get everything done. And we just, it was just one of those things that you find yourself asking, is this really all there is? I mean, I'd, I'd always been the good girl. I'd always done what my parents expected. I, I grew up in a very loving home, and I knew the Lord. I was, a, I was very involved with ministry in my church, and I but I just, we just started going so fast that I started to put, I forgot my first love, mm. Jesus Christ, is really what happened. But I just, I, st I got caught up in all the worldly things, and, and I just, stopped spending that time with the Lord and that just invited a, a period of darkness. And, mm -hmm. and when you isolate yourself and when you start having secrets, it just really sets you up. And that's exactly what happened to me. So you guys had two career paths and instead of going together and growing together, you saw yourselves growing apart. Right. And along with that, there was this loss of contact with God. Right, absolutely. And, and was there a lot of pressure on you being raised in uh, a family, being designated as a PK, a preacher's kid? Your dad was a minister and yeah. was there some pressure really on you, you know, experiencing this now, having those values growing up and, you know, that expectation? There, there, I think the biggest pressure was the pressure I put on myself. I always, I was a pleaser. I really wanted to be, I wanted to do, make my parents happy. I wanted to make God happy. And I put so much pressure on myself that I, I, I was such a rule follower and I was so almost rigid and, and legalistic in a lot of ways. And I just, I wanted to do everything right. And then when all of a sudden life presented this, this time, and, and it really was, it really talk about a desert time. It was just a time that I found myself and I don't even really understand exactly how I got there but I was I was lonely and despair and just really um, so far away from I, I didn't want anyone to know that was the biggest thing and I think that's what happens even in a lot of churches people don't want anyone to know what's really going on the on the inside and especially you know I grew up in the south and you just you always are gonna put on a happy face right, and put right. on that mask right, and right. I was one of those people on the outside it just looked like everything was great right, right, and, I, and right. I, I was happy to to fulfill that, that you know, facade, but but you know, God is so He wants that deep, dark part of us. He wants to bring it all out, and so I I just it just I see how easy it can happen. And and you know, it's interesting because God sometimes has to bring us to this place. Yes, you we're know. not fooling Him. Right. Yeah. I may have fooled everyone around me, yeah. but I never fooled him. Well, that brings me to the next question. What, what did your friends think? What were what were they saying about what was going on with your marriage and what was going on at this point in your life? Did did they did you experience a lot of criticism and? Not no, I didn't because again, nobody really knew what was going on. I, I as I said, I found myself in this really dark place, and then I started to make some bad decisions, and that really took me on a on a very very um, destructive path. Path, and I ended up meeting someone else and who seemed to be all the answers to all my problems. Mm -hmm. And that just took me on a very, very dangerous, um, destructive path. So no one knew. Again, I was all about secrecy. I was all about the facade. So nobody knew nobody knew what was going on in the inside and then I found myself living a double life and that just became incredibly stressful and, and uh, destructive and I just got to a point where I thought there is literally no way out of this. I've gotten myself in too deep. I can't get out. And, and so, so, so the, 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 I guess the, the main issue was keeping this secret yes. you know, and living this secret. Yes. Were you living with like this secret disappointment? Were you living with this secret? What was it about the secret part of you that became so detrimental? Well, the biggest part is the condemnation. The secret 
knowing uh, knowing what I was on the inside I mean I knew that I, I projected this this facade but on the inside I knew what I was living with myself and that con condemnation became overwhelming and I just really I and you know that's what happens we start to condemn ourselves and we forget Romans 8 1 that in Jesus Christ there is no condemnation and you know I, I've always said that I've often said we have these voices in our head and the voices that are yelling at us the ones that say never you will never you will always those are the voices we hear loud and clear but the voice of Jesus is usually a whisper and right. oftentimes we don't hear that and that's what happened to me I as that secret became a condemnation and I just the more I condemned myself the more the deeper I went and the and the um, stronger I kept the secret mm. because I, I wasn't worthy to to deal with it but again you know God is yeah, and I, and I guess, you know, I, I, I guess we, you know, we don't want people to know no. the real inside of us. Right. Because the real be us ugly. is all that we have. Yes. And if you find out who we really are, you might not like it. And who I really am is all I really have. Right. You know, and, and yeah, it, it's, it's, in, it's interesting because, you know, you know, living with, with secrets and living with, the inability to express how you really feel is sounds like oh, right. what you were struggling with right and that's what happened I just could not I couldn't get out of that because it starts perpetuating itself and the more condemnation the deeper you go and so you you know it really but but what's so what is so amazing and to me the the hope of my message is that it was a small cry it was a small cry out to God I have I thought at one point I was just so low there was nowhere else to go and I and I you know I knew God and so I, I it was harder for me because I knew what I was doing I knew the choices that I were, I was making were not pleasing to him and and at one point out of pure desperation, I cried out a simple prayer, God, save me. I, I'm, I'm in too deep. I need your help. And then slowly, one step after another, he literally took my hand and just walked with me through this journey of healing and reconciliation and revival. He revived my soul. Mm. And I guess that leads us to the writing of the book. Right. You know. Yeah, he, I really felt the Holy Spirit told me to, I, the book started as a journal. I was really journal, journaling my feelings. And, but then as, as he started to repair me and, and um, heal me and repair my relationship with my husband, I, I stopped writing because I, I was, I was on a better, I'm in a better place. But the right. Holy Spirit told me, finish the book. And mm. I thought, of course, because it is such a, a, a story of hope and, and um, an out. There's an out. No matter what we've gotten ourselves into, God knows. God knows. And so he wants that wholeness. He wants us to be healed. And so he just gently will pursue us until we're ready to, to deal with it. But that simple cry is all it takes, saying, I'm ready. I need help. So the title of Great Worth, how did that how did that come about? I mean, it's it's from the the verse in First uh, Peter, uh, chapter three, verse four, the one that says, you know, with women we adorn ourselves with jewelry and you know our hair and our makeup and but really what is of great worth to God is the inside, a gentle spirit, a gentle and quiet spirit. That is what is precious to God. That is what is of great worth. Wow. And I I learned that. I learned that. I thought it was all the external things, the smile on my face, the right, right. how I look and, and how our children, how our family looked. Right. No, what it's on the inside. That's what he cares about. That's what he seeks to know. And he knows the good, the bad, the ugly. He knows all of that and he loves us anyway. And, and, you know, in your book, you know, you, you touch on mentorship and why it's important for women to have mentors and right. people that they can share their secrets with and share things that they're struggling with. Why is that important beyond the obvious? Um, Bishop Taylor, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is a huge thing, a huge thing for me. I, I, I wish, looking back, I wish I had somebody to come alongside me. You know, that Titus verse about the older women have, have teaching the younger women how to love their husbands, how to be a wife. And I really didn't have that. I lived far away from my family. I had a great role model, my mother. My mother adored my father and just loved him until the day he died, still loves him. And so I had a great role model, but she was far away. And here I was living far away by myself, and I didn't really have that mentor, that, that godly woman to say, yes, sick. 
gets hard sometimes, even in a Christian marriage, even a churchgoer. Mm -hmm. It's hard sometimes, and there are times when you may question your love and is this all there is. Mm -hmm. But it, there's hope at the end of that. So I'm, I feel passionate about um, for the older women to be that mentor, to be that available for those younger women, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you who those women are that need to, you, for you to walk alongside them. And for the younger women, I say, if you find yourself in that struggle, find, look for a godly woman that you can appreciate and, and watch and go after, and especially if you have a secret, mm -hmm. share that secret and start to deal with it. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now. Uh, what would you say to women today that, I mean, even after hearing such encouraging words in terms of the value and equity of mentors and, you know, the older women being available, the younger women seeking those women out, but yet there are women today that are where you were, sinking in a depressive state because of many different things in their marriage. And there, what would you say to women that are at that place where they just were not being penetrated by any of the external voices that were trying to rescue them? What would you say to them? The first thing I would say to them is God loves them so much. He loves them, and that will never change. That verse that I talked about earlier about there's no condemnation in Christ, the last verse of that chapter, which I, chapter 8 is one of my favorite chapters, it says there's no separation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would let them know and remind them over and over is God loves them, and nothing will separate that love from, from Him. And the second thing I would say is there is hope. There is hope, and don't believe those yelling voices, those condemning voices that are in your head. Don't believe them because they're lies. The, you know, what God would say is you are my my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. That's what Jesus would say to us. Yeah. Not you're this horrible person who's doing horrible things. No, Jesus would say, you are my beloved daughter. And, and why, why is it important that those messages be reinforced in the hearts and minds of women today? Because, because we hear the, we, we have, you know, again, I mean, like all women, we have, we're subjected to all these Again, what we look at and see in the magazines and these beautiful people and the Hollywood stars, and they seem to have everything all together. But, you know, the biggest thing about that is we don't have all the data. I heard that quote one time, and I love it. We don't have all the data. And so it's so easy for us to look at our neighbors and, and look at other moms in the carpool line and think, gosh, you know, they have it together. I remember driving down the street, and at a stop sign, I would look over and see another woman, and I thought, wow, she doesn't have anything that I'm dealing with. You know, we, we just... We build that up, but that's so, those are such lies. Mm. Everybody struggles, and everybody, and, and only Jesus Christ, only Jesus Christ will be able to satisfy all the needs that we have. And, and, and what, would you, what would you say to husbands? I mean, because I know we've talked a lot about, you know, women, and, but what would you say to husbands that are part of this? I mean, what, what, what words of encouragement or direction would you give to husbands that are part of this, obviously? Well, the biggest thing is, is that I would say to a husband is first, you know, I would encourage them to get their relationship with Jesus Christ, because the closer they get to God, the more they're going to be able to have the love of Christ in their marriage. And, you know, God tells the husband, he, he commands them to love their wives and to cherish them. And the biggest thing, too, that, that what my husband and I both learned is he learned how to listen to me. When I said, when I, because for a year before I, I really had our, our worst problem, I was telling him, I'm not happy something's wrong and you know looking back he'll say that he he didn't really hear what I was saying and so I would just but again if the closer a husband the closer the man of the house gets to God the more he's going to be able to convey that love of Christ to his wife and to his children I mean of great worth is so powerful because I think it gets at things that are hidden that never really get talked about because so many times you know your husband can be in the regular throes of life and not even recognize right. that you have like you said the yeah. secret you know yeah. and you say it so eloquently in your book you know and so hiding that behind the facade that you present every day because you don't want people to know the real right. secret hurt 
Yeah. And my husband, my husband, um, you know, he didn't even know about any of this. And then the, after the Lord really brought us back together and healed our relationship and, and gave us a double portion of blessing by having two more children, that was the biggest blessing of the whole situation. But and the thing is, I could have lived the rest of my life, no one would have ever known. But first of all, I thought, I'm never going to be in darkness again in those secrets. Right. And secondly, throughout the scriptures, it talks about, um, you know, declare what the Lord has done for you. And, it, and with my husband's encouragement, he allowed me to tell my story and tell our story, which was a huge risk for him because it, it you know, our reputation is at hand. But we know, we both believe that the Lord has our reputation. We know it's a, it's a story of hope that people should hear mm -hmm. and, and encouragement. And we, and that, um, that verse, I love the uh, David, you know, after he had been with Bathsheba and in Psalm 51, when he said, I, I, um, if you restore to me and take away the guilt of my bloodshed, yes. he said, I will teach the transgressors. Mm. And that just, that's what God did. He took away my guilt, my shame. He took away all of that, healed us, put on us on solid ground. It's hard not to declare what the mighty Lord can do. Wow. Wow. And, and when you, and now I guess that was big for your husband to say, you know, let's, let's share the yes. story and, and how, what, 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 what impact did it have on your, your immediate surroundings, your children? And how did that, how did that, were they like, I'm not sure I, I want that to be shared. They, they were, um, our children range, range in age from 25 to 16 and we have three daughters and one son and, and they were all, um, we, I obviously really went and we kind of had a family meeting before the book came out. But the thing is what we were teaching them, and again, part of that taking off that facade and being transparent, what my husband and I were teaching our children is that when you go through those valleys, which you will, you will go through valleys. And if it's not a troubled marriage, it could be financial situation or an illness or a, a terrible job or a bad relationship, friendship, whatever they are. We, what we were teaching them is that God is the answer and he will make a way when there seems to be no way. And so our children really, and they see how we are now. They see how much we love each other. They see how God has blessed our family and our, our relationship. So that's what we were teaching them. And so they, they are, they, I don't know how much they love it, but they are <laughs> definitely on board. Well, I know one thing you said that was significant and I just want to make sure we, we hit it is that you know during that crisis in your your marriage you know you said you had a second chance in a sense when you had two additional kids yes at what point did you have the second set of children well our first two children are two years apart and then we had about three almost four years of, of our difficult time and it was after we God really brought us back together because um, we always had talked about having four children, but it just seemed like that plan was not going to happen because right. of our troubles. Right. And then afterward, we, we talked about having more children. And it really wasn't until later that I feel like the Lord revealed to me that that was a double portion of blessing for all that we had been through. And it was. And our, I mean, all of our children are just incredible blessings, incredible blessings. But the, to have two more and, and complete what we had always wanted to do was just the biggest blessing from God. And so you're... Your ages of your children are? 25, 23, 19, and 16. God bless you. Wow, <laughs> wow. And it's just, it's really amazing to see how God really brought this whole thing full circle. A book was produced out of it. You're teaching people from your own experiences, the healing process that you've experienced, the truth of living in openness, in yeah. relationship. No more secrets, um, no, no more, more darkness. Secret. Listen, if you had um, time to, you know, uh, preach a whole message, it would be amazing, but we've got a couple of minutes and I want you to look into the camera right over here and just talk to the potentially millions of women that are watching us today and give them some words of wisdom before we depart. I'd be happy to. For women that are in a bad situation or a trouble or, or feel like you've done something that is so bad and so wrong that God could not love you, that is a lie. He will never stop loving you. He will always love you. And he wants you to come back. And to the, so for those, I would say reach out and find somebody, a godly woman that you can go and confess your sins to. God will honor that. And for the older women that have been through these things, reach out and ask the Holy Spirit to show you these younger women who are so in need of hearing a, a message of hope and encouragement. You have what they need and you can give that to them. And God will honor you for being obedient in that way.